Morning everybody, time for coffee with Rob. Hope everybody's doing good. We're in Mark chapter one. Oh, it's a beautiful day today, a beautiful Wednesday morning. Um, we're in Mark chapter one. Uh, again, we're gonna start at verse 29. And um, we left off yesterday at uh, verse uh, 28, when news about Jesus spread, spread quickly all over the region of Galilee because of his preaching and soon to be uh, because of his miracles and the things he's doing to help mankind. So, let me move that down a little bit. <clears throat> um, but just a review from yesterday and from the day before. <clears throat> Remember the prophets and uh, predicted that Jesus would come or foretold that Jesus would come. In the present, he fulfilled those prophets. And then in the future, Mark wrote that, that soon he will fill us with the Holy Spirit. So that was prophetic. Uh, about the church age, it was to come in Acts chapter 2. So, not only in the prophets of the past, but Mark, uh, not necessarily a prophet, but certainly a, a disciple or apostle of Christ, uh, basically predicted or told the future by saying, in the future, he will fill us with the Holy Spirit. But he knew that firsthand because he saw that actually happen. So, um, maybe not prophetic, but definitely a real firsthand a version of what's happened. Then we have the authentication of Jesus through God, the ascension or the descension of the Holy Spirit into Christ's body to begin his ministry on uh, Jesus himself. So you have the Trinity all in one place at one time at Jesus' baptism. And then finally, what I really like too, is as we get down to the nitty gritty, we get out of the like the prophecies and the powers, like the, the spiritual powers, but we get down to basically the earth level where mankind, and that is the devil tempts him. The demons recognize him. And now the people begin to recognize him, which I really love because all these things are happening. Uh, you had uh, the Jews ruled everything. The law ruled everything. The Pharisees and Sadducees ruled everything under Roman control. And now people are beginning to recognize that this guy is different. So just authenticating who Jesus was through real experience is beginning to happen. And then in verse 29 of Mark chapter, verse 28 of Mark chapter 1, news about him spread quickly over the whole region. For news to spread that quickly in that region at that time, something significant was going on. So let's go down to verse 29 and begin for today. Mark chapter 1, verse 29. Here's the word uthios again. Remember we said Mark is the go gospel because uthios quickly or immediately occurs in the book of Mark at least 42 times. So here's one of those times. As soon or as immediately they left the synagogue. Jesus, an interesting thing here, Jesus leaves the synagogue after showing, number one, he has authority over the teaching, authority in the synagogue, authority over demons, and now he's leaving. And I just want to do an application on that part. It's great that his presence showed up. He had to do that to show he had authority in the synagogue. He had lost authority because of man's influence. They had diminished his authority. They had taken, and we do this in churches today, which is, this is the application I'm looking at. How often the focus isn't on the scriptures, it isn't on Jesus Christ or the cross even, it's on the speaker, it's on the entertainment, and it's on the music. And I say this as a warning to churches and to believers because if you're overdoing those things, uh, overdoing the entertainment, oh, it's got to be amazing. There's nothing wrong with good entertainment. It should not take place of the worship or the teaching of Jesus Christ. The worship, the, the music can be great. It can usher in a spirit, uh, a great anointing spirit to receive the message. But the focus of every church service should be the teaching of the word as it points to Jesus Christ and the cross. And so as soon as they left the synagogue, the reason I brought that up, it was because what you don't want in your church is for Jesus Christ to leave the building. Uh, he left the synagogue. His presence left. You don't want him to leave your church. You want God's presence in your church service every week. Where two or three are gathered in his name, he's in their presence. Are you gathered in his name? Are you there? Is it a country club? Are you there to be entertained? Are you there to feel good? Are you there to meet your Savior? And that's what church is for. We're there to meet our Savior. We're there to learn about our Savior. We're there. Another one I like, too, in the church is just to come in and relax. Get away from the hustle and bustle and the daily grind and come in and relax and just say, thank you, God, for a beautiful week. Thank you for getting me to this point. Lord, teach me about you. Strengthen my spirit. Strengthen my heart through your word. So the word makes us stronger. The music makes us feel good. 
And so uh, what you don't want is for Jesus to leave your building. You want him in your presence. You want him in your services above all things. And actually, I think in, Re in Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Billy Graham and evangelists offer you, uh, often use that as Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. I think it's a great application. He's knocking on the door of your heart. He's saying, please let me come in and be your Savior. But I'm going to say this. That was right after um, John wrote about the seven churches. And he gave some good things and some bad things about the seven churches. And then what do we see? Jesus on the outside knocking on the door trying to get in. I hope that's not your church. Obviously, he wants in your heart. But let's make sure we're operating correctly as churches so that we're focusing on Christ and he's not on the outside looking in going, hey, guys, great service, great music, great entertainment, but I'm not in there. So just remember that. That's one of these verses. Mark 1, 29, Jesus left the synagogue. You don't want that. You don't want him leaving the synagogue. And in the case of Saul in the Old Testament, like David noticed, you don't want him leaving your life. Repeated sin, attitude, neglecting him, he will leave you alone, you won't be operating in the power. You don't want to be in your life, your church, your house, your, your place of employment. Bring them into your place of employment. Be a great employee. That doesn't mean you have to uh, proselytize at work, but be a work a model worker so that people see that through your legitimate work efforts, you're on time, you do your job, you do what you're supposed to, you usher God as presence into your workplace by work ethic. So, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon, Andrew, Simon's mother. So he's got the four guys he called in the, in the previous verses. He's got those four guys with him. And they go to Peter's house where his mother-in-law was in bed. So here's another thing. Some people say, well, Peter didn't have a wife. He was the first pope and all that. Well, here it is. He has a mother-in-law, so he has to be married. So his mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they told Jesus about her. So he went over. Here's a key thing. And I like this. If you have a Bible, I highlighted this. He took her hand and helped her up. Isn't that just like Jesus? Don't you want him to do that every day? God, I'm a man. I try to be a strong man. I try to be a godly man. But man, I need you to take my hand once in a while. Specifically after I leave in my church just recently. It was so difficult. And the way it happened was just not fair. Really not fair. But Literally, God, take my hand, lift me up in this moment, use me. I'm not going to stop preaching the gospel. You can throw me out. Well, they didn't throw me out, but I can leave the church. But the gospel is not chained. I don't care where you are. Your gospel is not chained. Lord, pick me up. Use me. Help me unchain the gospel in my life and preach the gospel. And he'll take your hand. So he takes her hand. So the, the, the in this verse, verse 31, he went over and took her hand. And this would be literally um, uh, out of order for him as a Jew. Uh, she was infected. She had a fever. And in Leviticus 5, and Levit I looked these up, Leviticus 13, 45, if you touch somebody that's unclean or sick, you yourself become unclean. But isn't that great? And that's a message to all of us. If you're a sinner, you're unclean. If you're broken, you're unclean. If you're diseased, you're unclean. But look at what Jesus does. He will take your hand. He will pick you up. He's not afraid to touch you. He's not afraid to be associated with you. And likewise, we shouldn't be as ashamed to be associated with him. And he lifts her up, and the fever left her, and she began to wait on them. She's so motivated by her healing. She, well, maybe that was her role, but, but literally, wow, she's up. She was laying down in bed sick, very sick. She gets up. She starts making dinner. How cool is that? Because he took her hand, and he healed her. So this just shows he has authority over demons, the synagogue, the law, over the devil, and now he has um, authority over disease. And uh, you'll see this further in verse 40. But he has authority over disease. More authenticating scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. So that evening after sunset, the people noticing this, as his fame grows, the whole region begins to hear what's going on. He just healed another woman by touching her hand. The fever left her. Now after sunset, all the people in the area, the whole town started to bring their sick to him and the demon possessed. Now that kind of freaks me out as just a regular person in today's age. Where are all these demon possessed people coming from and why are they there and how did that happen and is this happening in america today i would say yes going to some of the streets of philadelphia miami anywhere in your local city anybody that's addicted to drugs anything that they're acting a flaca and all these drugs that are out there are allowing demon possession to enter the human body and for what reason to destroy the crown of god's creation you were made in god's image and what do demons want to do? They want to enter you. They want to destroy you. Don't let them in. Don't let them in. Don't let them in. So 
Uh, basically, he shows he has authority over disease, demons, and the devil. And now the whole town is gathered at the door. So uh, as Jesus healed many who had various diseases, he drove out. Look at all those D words there. Demons, demons possessed, doors. He drove out in disease. So if you want to make up a sermon or something, there you go. Use the word D. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak. Now, some people have asked me, why did he do that? Because he doesn't want demons being creatures. They know him. They know him very well. They were in heaven with him, Revelation 12 again. They were with him in the beginning. They know the plan of salvation. They've seen Jesus face to face in heaven. And so what they would do, just like they're doing with their time on earth, trying to destroy human beings, what do you think they'd do if they got a hold of the gospel? And look at the authority of Jesus Christ. You are not allowed to preach my gospel. Now what's happening today that we're finding is they're entering people, and people are preaching the gospel. <clears throat> They're distorting the gospel. If it's for any other reason that the gospel is being preached, like, you know, I love, you know, there's people preaching, uh, Jesse Duplantis, um, you know, all these guys that are preaching. Duplantis is the one that drives me nuts. Jesus needed a hug, so he came to my office and I hugged him. Bull crap. That is not true. Jesse Duplantis is not meeting with Jesus because uh, Jesus needs a hug. I promise you, that's a lie. These people may be demonic. I'm not saying they are. They may be. Don't listen to them. When you start hearing that Jesus needed me to hug him, you're wrong, and you're lying, and you're trying to get money. By the way, give me $1,000, you can hug him too. No, just quit doing that, people. Be smart. So, um, but he wouldn't let the demons speak. So the demons today will use people to speak, um, and they're doing that very well, by the way. And people are allowing themselves to be used in that way. So he wouldn't let them speak because they want to destroy God's image. That's why they possess you. Then if they preach the message about how they, they could attack the image of God, that would be us by misleading us to a false gospel, which is also happening today. And, and they would do this uh, with the gospel, and they again, they use men. So there's three things that I was just noting. Why didn't he let the demons speak? Because their number one agenda is to destroy the image of God. That's you and me. We're made in God's image. And number two, they would do this with the gospel. They would distort it. They would pervert it. And it's happening today. Jesus at this time in his presence said, no, you're not preaching. I'm not allowing you to preach. And then finally, like I said, he will use, they will use men to preach the gospel and distort it. So it's changing, unfortunately, in these last days. Listen to your preacher. Make sure they're preaching the gospel for your best interest as obedience to God and not to line their pockets or not preaching something that subverts the teaching of God or perverts the gospel or doesn't line up with the gospel let the bible be your frame of reference so there <clears throat> that's 34 mark chapter one we'll try to make it to the end here very early in the morning while it was still dark jesus got up and left uh the house and went off to a solitary place he's wore out he's tired he's a man as well as god he is the hypostatic union perfectly man perfectly god in a human body so he's wearing out this is great about our savior you get tired i get tired you go run 10 miles, go work an 8-hour shift, 10-hour shift, 12-hour shift. You're exhausted. Jesus was exhausted from healing people, preaching the gospel, walking around, helping people, lifting people up by the hand. And, uh, and so he went to a solitary place where he prayed. What's he going to do? He's going to get alone with the Father, what we should do on a daily basis as well. He needed a rest. And I, and I use this as jokingly, but all of you have seen the movie Superman. And what did Superman have? He had a, a, a place of solitude. He had a fortress of solitude. Even Superman had to get away once in a while and rest. So here's our Superman, our God-man, Jesus, who needed a break. So he goes to a solitary place to get alone with the Father. But hey, look what happened. Simon and his companions went to look for him. Where's he at? Where's he at? And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. He's famous. He's popular. He's, he's the, the, the latest thing. And, and he's showing people something different while they're under the oppression of the Roman government and the religious, whatever they are. So, uh, verse 38, Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach. Uh, so I can preach there also. This is why I have come. If you want to know why Jesus came, uh, 1 John 3 is a great place to read. But this is one. Why did he come? He didn't come to feed the, 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 the multitudes. He didn't necessarily come to even do miracles. All those things pointed to him as Messiah. They authenticated who he was. But he really came to preach the gospel. What? To seek and save the lost. And that was us. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Another thing I like to note here, 
Because notice how he went to the religious establishments and preached. He went to their synagogues and again, driving out demons in the synagogue. There are demons in your church, I promise you. Uh, so be aware, be alert. And folks, if you're new to a church and you're looking for Jesus Christ and you want to get right, don't let that person in the church ruin you. Jesus won't do it to you. Just overlook that person. Try to look to the pulpit. Try to hear the word of God. Don't let them distract you from doing what you know is right to follow Christ. So um, let's just stop there. And then I'll finish up the chapter tomorrow from verse 40 on. But notice that in the next verse, you're going to see Jesus touches a man of leprosy against Levitical law or against the law. And that is verses of Leviticus 5.3 and Leviticus 13.45 that say don't touch a diseased person because you become unclean. But the amazing thing is we're all unclean. We're all filthy. We're all dirty sinners. We have nothing to offer but filthy rags. But Jesus isn't afraid to reach down and touch you and help you and lift you up when you have a need or you cry out for help. Uh, the song, He Touched Me. There you go. And, and that's such a powerful song when you think about what he was up against in his time with Jewish law uh, over his uh, over his head, over his shoulder. So anyway, I uh, hope everybody has a great day. That's about 16 minutes. Uh, again, if you have any prayer requests or questions, send them in. I'm, I'm thrilled and happy to answer those and help out any way I can. And uh, have a great day till I see you tomorrow.